So uh, I am Brandon Knowlton, uh, that's me. I manage all of the projects uh, at Europeana, um, including the uh, engagement projects, including the aggregation, the distribution that we do. Uh, today, uh, I'm really just going to take about 20 minutes of your time. Uh, you're generally aware of Europeana as a project, but I'd like to tell you briefly what it is that we're trying to do. Perhaps it's not always as obvious uh, from the outside as it is from the inside. What engagement with audiences looks like for us, what that sort of community building, how that works, and then what is next for us. So starting very briefly on, on what Europeana actually is as a project, um, most obviously Europeana is a website, certainly. It's very pretty, it has lots of art, it has lots of books. Um, if you haven't seen this version of it, you can just type preview.europeana.eu. This is the version that will be released in a couple of weeks. Um, but essentially, it, it, from the outside, the Europeana project mostly looks like this. It mostly just looks like a web page with a big search box. We think it's actually a bit more. Um, certainly, in part, it is a, a whole series of websites. Uh, we have thematic uh, website projects uh, working on a number of areas. Uh, we have projects that deal with fashion and deal with books and deal with libraries and deal with all sorts of things, um, including the, um, uh, the one that I'm going to talk more about today, which is dealing with the First World War. Um, but even that is still simplistic. We think of ourselves as being doing a lot more than just making websites. In fact, I would say we're not particularly good at making websites. What we are fairly good at is making a data service um, and an application interface on top of that service. So for most of us in the office, Europeana looks more like this. It looks more like just uh, a bunch of data. You put in queries, you get back data. So this is what we, this is kind of how we think of Europeana many times, is just as a, as an application programming interface built on top of a database. Um, our data service um, is based on 120 aggregators um, and data providers. Uh, who represent collectively more than 2,000 institutions in Europe. Um, and so they're contributing so far about, well, 22, 23 million uh, digital cultural heritage objects, of which about 5 million are available for commercial reuse, which has to do mostly with licensing and rights and how those are assigned. Um, but this, this puts us very much in the role of being a, a a technical standards body, if you will, a metadata provider. Um, but it's, it's complex, however we do it. Our job is to federate and to aggregate and to find the things in common between the, the cultural heritage that is provided through projects from here and elsewhere. So how do we do that? We, we have really four principles that define how we do what we do. The first is probably the most obvious. We're trying to build a trusted source for cultural heritage uh, in Europe and in the world, which implies that our focus is on institutions, it's on trusted sources, it's on people who have the reputation of being good curators and good librarians and good archivists. So that's our, that's our focus, is on that building that level of trust and communicating it back out uh, to Europe rather than treating ourselves just as trying to collect everything um, but we also have, I think, an important role in facilitation. We try to support the sector itself, the cultural heritage sector, all of you, all of many other institutions. We try to do a certain amount of knowledge transfer. We try to work on innovation. We do research and development. Uh, we do advocacy on issues like, uh, you know, orphan works and copyright legislation on an EU level. Our website is certainly a way that we distribute that cultural heritage back out again. So our third main track of our work and how our office is organized is around distribution, which is mostly making websites and making applications. But increasingly, our focus is on making heritage available to users wherever they are. And the desktop website is not going to be the future of Europeana any more than it is the, the future of the web in general. And then, in some ways, the hardest part of what we do, which is to really try to engage to really try to create these connections. It's very difficult. We want, we want to cultivate new ways for users to participate in their cultural heritage. And we 
we see ourselves very much as simply trying to facilitate these connections between um, all of the archivists, all of the librarians, all of the museum curators who have collected cultural heritage and have described it. And now we're trying to facilitate a new kind of engagement back with users. So these tend to relate, of course, these, these four things that we try to do. Aggregation leads to a better job of facilitation. If we do that well, we can distribute more widely. Um, if we have our distribution channels working, then we can create certain kinds of engagement, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes now, which is what we actually try to do when we try to engage users with cultural heritage, and a couple of things that we've tried to do so far. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to cultivate new ways for users to participate. What we find is that engagement with Urapiana as a repository of you know, 25 million objects, it's, it's too broad. It's too, it's too wide. There's no, there's no single thing to latch on there and really make it interesting, except for people whose research is about digital humanities and about large data, large open data sets. So while we facilitate people who are mining data in a very large way, mostly we have to come up with much smaller sets of principles that we can use to create a user engagement concept that we think will work. So what we do is rather than try for one channel and one set of data and one set of users, we do a lot of experiments. We do them at the same time. So simultaneously, we'll be trying four or five or eight different ways of engaging users. But for each of those concepts, we need to first define our target groups very, very carefully. We generally have to think about content that is related to a theme. Um, the Europeana database is too broad to be considered a, a source of engagement, we find. We find we're much more successful when we have a theme of content. We involve partners. We don't expect that you know, the, the 35 of us who work at this you know, nonprofit project group in, in The Hague in the Netherlands, we're, we're not enough to represent your audiences and, and your users. Uh, we can at best try to keep up with the technology, but we need partners to reach audiences. Europeana is, you know, we're, we're a fairly small Dutch nonprofit when it comes to it. We don't have a large audience ourselves. And so we are relying on these 2,000 institutions around Europe who have audiences, who have people who care deeply about cultural heritage. And then we need to put that onto some sort of interactive platform. And sometimes we build these, uh, and increasingly we're trying to find them. We would much rather find someone else's platform and use it in a good way than continue to make applications and make websites. Because once you make a website, you have to keep maintaining it. And we have enough platforms already, really. So these new experiments that we try, we're mostly trying to find platforms that we can use to connect to partners, to connect to themed content, and to connect to target groups. So a couple of things that we've tried. We've tried a few things that are engaging strictly online with this sort of idea. So virtual exhibitions are an, are an obvious way to take a curated bit of content and actually walk someone through a journey. So, exhibitions.europeana.eu, uh, partners can select content, uh, translate it, find things that are interesting, put them together one by one. So this is about the, the individual items rather than the bulk experience of a database. It's a little formulaic, it's not terribly interactive, uh, but it's an interesting way to provide a very curated and targeted set of resources. So you can identify a target group if it's the project on uh, scanning and digitizing uh, plans for musical instruments, then you have a particular idea of who's interested in old instruments. You have an idea of what platform we're going to use to reach them. Uh, you have an idea of what sort of content you can put together and put into this exhibition, and that can create a concept, and you can see whether it's successful. We think about cultural professionals as being uh, one of the groups that we're trying to reach, and in fact, in terms of creating engagement, one of our main goals is to help uh, each institution and each country and each project connect better to each other. To us, that's a very important part of the engagement that we do because we think then together we'll all be much better at reaching end users. 
Um, so doing a, doing a website that is specifically for cultural professionals, pro.europeana.eu, is one of the projects that we put, have to put a fair amount of time into just to keep documentation up to date and standards working, and registration and networking and all sorts of things. We do an end user blog, not very interesting, but it actually gets more attention than most of the more sophisticated things that we do. Um, so here's, you know, whatever, 80, 100,000 people who are reading about content that has been selected that gets pushed to them on a regular basis. A fairly obvious, you know, platform and an obvious user group. Um, but for there, again, you have to find just the treasures of a collection, just the really interesting bits. And the other side of that, you know, with a newsletter, when you're pushing things out instead of waiting for people to pull them back. The, these are all just platforms. They can all generate user engagement. The same with a professional blog. The, we did a project uh, recently using the uh, Pinterest social networking site. We did this um, project along with the University of Barcelona and the Biblioteca de Catalunya. Um, and we kind of worked together to try to think about what sort of objects might be of interest on the Pinterest uh, social networking platform and how that might work. Uh, and so we had people within these partners, again, working through the partners, uh, selecting uh, images that would be interesting, uh, making sure that they were aggregated into the Europeana central repository, then linking from there to create Pinterest boards, which got you know thousands of followers and got lots of interest online. Um, Pinterest for us is actually, um, I mean, it's generating more inbound traffic now than most other social network sites, and it's generating more inbound traffic than most institutional websites. It's really second to, second to Google in terms of referrals for us and for most of our partners. And it, it seems a trivial example to pick 50 photographs and put them up on a Pinterest board and see if people are interested, but it, it does in fact create a conversation. It creates, uh, com it creates comments back and forth. And then we've tried some projects that really connect to the offline world, which in some ways is a lot harder than just using online tools where our channels actually involve uh, people doing stuff in the world. These are, these are very difficult, but they're, they're very worth it. Um, our, our Wiki Loves Monument project, where we collaborate with the Mickey, Wikimedia Foundation. We have people uh, go take pictures of monuments and buildings, publicly accessible artwork around Europe, and submit it through uh, to the Wikipedia project. And we help them run a photo contest and select entries and so forth. And we make sure that the photographs end up both in the Wikimedia Commons database uh, and ingested into Europeana at the end. So it's something that involves a lot of people doing work with cameras to try to fill out some of the gaps in the, in the Wikipedia space. We run uh, hackathons and developer events, developer days, uh, which we've kind of generally branded Hack for Europe or hackathons, where we kind of put a lot of the IT people together in a room and say, okay, you've got 48 hours, here's our API, here's a bunch of other APIs, uh, here are some design resources, here's some subject matter expertise, build something that's really interesting. Uh, and then we have competitions and do prizes and try to select uh, applications that will do good things in the future. And so we've seen a lot of interesting prototypes, a lot of proofs of concept. I, I hope that in the next few years we'll start seeing some of these ideas from the hackathon start showing up in the real world as things that people will want to use. Up until now, it's been very difficult to bring these quickly developed applications out to a commercial market, uh, mostly because of licensing issues with the metadata. It wasn't always available to use Europeana metadata to make a commercial application. Um, but now that our metadata is more open, uh, not the cultural objects themselves, but at least the description fields, they're now a bit easier to share under a Creative Commons Zero public domain dedication license. So probably these sort of applications over the next couple of years will start going in interesting directions. And then we've been doing these collection days, getting down to the, the most physical, the most activity of people in rooms actually showing up and bringing objects that they find interesting. And, and this has been a very interesting uh, collection of partnerships where in this case we pick up a, 
uh, a period in history. We've been looking at 1914 to 1918, the First World War, to start with. And pretty soon we're going to start on 1989 and think about the fall of the Iron Curtain and transformations in Europe. Um, where we say, okay, let's, let's have people in an area bring their materials into a local archive or a local library and scan them and digitize them and catalog them and interview people and then give them their stuff back. Let them take it back home with them. Don't have the, have the local institution facilitate um, a gathering of metadata and cultural content but not actually keep the items themselves. This definitely goes against a lot of the standard models of, of being an archivist or being a librarian. But it creates a level of connection that's really quite interesting to see. Um, I'm going to take uh, two minutes, if that's okay, to play a short video we made about what that looks like uh, in, in, li in libraries, which, which we think is a European very... European is Europe's multilingual digital library museum and archive available worldwide online. Europeana already gives people the chance to discover Europe's rich cultural heritage. It provides an instant doorway to millions of digitized books, paintings, films and objects from national collections. Now Europeana is taking a new step to bring Europe's shared heritage alive by inviting people across the EU to put their own history online. Family History Roadshows, which invite people to share family stories and memorabilia from the First World War, have already been held in Germany, Luxembourg, Ireland, Denmark, the UK and Slovenia. The Roadshows have been hugely successful, attracting large crowds of people, each with a story to tell. Stories that can cross generations. Stories that can be told in new and innovative ways, opening up the digital world to many for the first time. The material that we collect will be used by students and by teachers and by researchers. Um, the material that we're getting are stories which have not been seen by the Academy. Family history finds its place in Europe's shared history, making the past relevant to today connecting us across time and borders. And it does so in ways that are relevant to how we live today, how we access information, how we share, and how we talk to each other in the 21st century. Importantly, Europeana also opens up our shared cultural heritage as inspiration and source material for Europe's creators, our artists, innovators, programmers and digital developers. Europeana provides open data that can be used in creating apps and web services for smartphones and tablets, for use in design, education, tourism and research, promoting digital developments that drive economic growth. Europeana, using our shared cultural heritage to help build Europe's economic future. Um, you, can, you can tell maybe that the European Commission pays for a lot of our work, right? <sighs> yeah, anyway, I spent so much time in Luxembourg now trying to explain what heritage actually is. But in any case, the, so that, that idea of connecting people in an area to a local institution, to a library, to an archive, um, it can be slow, it can be expensive, you can have volunteer catalogers there all day and have everything set up and really only have capacity to bring 50 people through in a day and get a few hundred objects maybe. It's, it's, it's a slow way to acquire but um, it, it creates a lot of good press, it creates a lot of goodwill and we think that it creates some connections then uh, between the library, between the archive and the people. Not, not really necessarily between people and Europeana, but between people and the institution where these events are held. That seems to be the way it works out in the end. So what are we doing next? We have a couple things in mind. First, uh, our data needs to continue to be linkable to more data in as many ways as possible. So we have you know, research on linked open data as a computer science idea and also the, the more pragmatic ways of connecting uh, the various 
uh, taxonomies, uh, tables of authority, ontology, collecting, collecting them, connecting them to our repository. We need to extend the licensing framework that covers Europeana's repository. We need to start offering options uh, to apply licensing information to content to digital objects themselves on an opt-in basis. We need to probably find a way that institutions can, if they wish, start actually making uh, objects available to third parties. Uh, and this is where it gets very contentious and very difficult, but it's something that we need to at least explore with our partners. And we'll continue these crowdsourcing campaigns uh, the Europeana 1914 to 1918 project will now be joined by Europeana 1989. Um, we, we use years because the, the terms for these events vary very widely between countries and uh, England and Germany and Belgium really don't agree. And our last and newest initiative, which is going to be to set up uh, an open laboratory network uh, where we start providing spaces uh, in Europe uh, places for people to come and be engaged with people doing rapid prototyping of applications uh, built on cultural heritage data. Uh, so starting next year, we will actually uh, have two of these spaces, one in, uh, one in Barcelona and one in Mallorca, um, based on spaces that are, that are already existing. We have local partners that we'll be starting to connect to with the idea of having uh, some of the expertise, sample content, very detailed knowledge of metadata and access to Europeana's product development team uh, to try to make those available within local spaces. So these are all things to watch, I think. Um, our, our website, of course, our search portal, our blog uh, for end users and for professionals. I think that, uh, that, there, that there might be some ideas there that you might find interesting and we would certainly very much appreciate uh, your input. We are not particularly interesting in and of ourselves. We are interesting only so far as we can help facilitate a very large network of institutions, of memory institutions around Europe who are able to cooperate in this new way. To the extent that that works, we'll be successful, and we think it will help you be successful as well. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.